Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. And uh, I'd like to give a nice welcome to Dr. Denny Cortez. Uh, Dr. Cortez is a visiting uh, perfect or uh, visiting speaker this morning uh, from up north in Fountain Hills, where it's below freezing. Uh, he is currently a foundation professor at Arizona State University. He serves as a director of ASU Center for Healthcare Delivery and Policy and is president of the nonprofit Healthcare Transformation Institute based in Phoenix. He's an emeritus president and CEO of the Mayo Clinic. He serves on the board of directors for Essence Global Holding Corporation and Pinnacle West Capital Corporation. He has memberships in national and international organizations, which include the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, where he served as the original chair of the Roundtable on Value and Science-Driven Healthcare. He's a national associate of the National Re Research Council and an honorary member of the Royal College of Physicians in London and Academia Nacional de Medicina in Mexico. He's formally served in the following positions as a member of the Healthcare Advisory Board of RAND. As a member, uh, he served as uh, chairman of the board, also of the Healthcare Leadership Council in Washington, D.C. He was a member of the Harvard Kennedy Health Policy Group, a member of the Division on Engineering and Physical Sciences of the National Academy of Engineering, and a member of the Board of Directors of Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in CERN. His education uh, comes from uh, where he got his bachelor's in Franklin and Marshall, and then an MD degree from Temple University, and he did his residency training in internal medicine and pulmonary diseases at the Mayo Clinic. He uh, has numerous awards, including an Ellis Island Award in 2007, the National Healthcare Leadership Award in 2009, and an American College of Medical Quality Founders Award in 2017. His topic today is the US, health, is the US healthcare system, current state and delivery models. So without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Cortese. Uh, good morning. It's a real pleasure to be uh, talking with you folks today. Uh, we have a fair number of things I'd, I'd like to cover as we go through this. So I'll just start the sharing of my screen. I'm going to be talking about uh, stop the sharing, continue. There we go. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is take you through some concepts with regard to healthcare. I want to talk about the current healthcare delivery system, but I'll also talk a little bit about the concepts of health and um, and how you all might feel about them, because there'll be some little quizzes here as we go through uh, this process. Uh, I'm going to, um, yeah, okay. Uh, let's take a little quiz here from you. How would you rank you this your personal satisfaction with the US healthcare system? Uh, there's one to five. Uh, and just uh, respond, and I think John will show us the answer shortly, but do you think it's really excellent? Is it good enough? Uh, is it okay, uh, especially if you're not sick? Uh, does it need some tweaking or some major changes? So go ahead and vote, and John, when you're ready, you can show us the result. Okay. All right, good. There's, there's a little leaning towards the bottom of the scale. Uh, so I'll close that. And let's move on to the next um, view. The, the medical industrial complex has been a term that's been applied to all of the, quote, stakeholders, unquote, um, that are involved in influencing healthcare in a very ongoing and elaborate way. A lot of lobbying going on, as you're well aware. I've just listed some of them here. This is the majority of them, actually. Um, and the, those groups exert influence on every aspect of the delivery system. The question I would ask for you to consider, just think about it, are they really stakeholders or are they merely vendors? Because where is the public in that list? Where is the patient? I've, I've, I've run many, many, many groups that have been a convener of stakeholders, and it is almost totally true in every meeting that patients are not usually there. I try to turn the, uh, the participants into patients by asking them to consider their answers uh, for all the stuff we've talked about as though they were pre-op, as were they were the actual patient 
Uh, and of course, many of them have been patients, but usually they come in to protect their own, um, their own interests from the standpoint of their business, perhaps, or their personal political uh, beliefs, et cetera. They don't usually come in to work to maximize the, uh, the, um, the work of the group that you pull together. They generally come in with an attitude of maximizing their own sector versus optimizing the output of the system. And that's a difficult situation to find yourself in when you're trying to actually solve a problem. So who is the primary stakeholder in healthcare? Uh, who serves the primary stakeholder? And really fundamentally, what is the viewpoint of the person or the patient? Uh, the primary stakeholder in my view is only one, and it basically is the patient. And the question is, uh, how, do, how would you view that? If we need to consider how to view what goes on here and look at our current delivery system and create a new vision for it, a new a vision meaning what is the music we want to hear coming out of this orchestra uh, that involves itself in caring for patients. And I'll ask you just some questions. Uh, just assume that you are a patient. So who would like to be hospitalized tomorrow? Most people would answer no, they would prefer not to. Who wants to be sick tomorrow? And, and then who actually wants to be a patient as defined by the dictionary as someone who long suffers and long endures? If you look at it in that light, and the, you, as I said, my viewpoint, persons who answer this question, are really the only stakeholders. All the rest of us are just vendors and we serve uh, the, the purpose of trying to help those patients. If we wanna have these results occur, have a no, a no, and a no for, our, for yourself, we need to sit back and redesign the system or reconsider the system as to what elements would be needed to accomplish this. We convened some groups of people uh, over the last five, not the last, but the, uh, for about five or six years in the mid 2000s. We convened over 1500 people, about 250 of them were actual patients representing themselves. And we came up with a few concepts that I'd just like to put out in front of you. The first concept is that overarching, we should be looking as in a way to create a learning system for healthcare throughout the country. A uh, quick definition for that would be that everyone in the healthcare system knows what the healthcare systems know within a click of a button. I know we're a long way from that, but we've improved actually over the last 20 years. And uh, that, when I say everyone in the system, that includes patients and their families. The next concept that uh, was prioritized during these many meetings, we had large meetings, uh, modest meetings, and we had many forums specifically talking about each one of these uh, concepts that I'm producing. Within the concept of an overarching national healthcare system, we do have already some internal learning organizations that are functioning right now. Everything in the blue is what delivery systems um, uh, could consider doing to improve uh, what, their, the, what their output is and how they take care of patients. So we do have some learning organizations and they, internally, they tend to have a better knowledge of what's going on on patients because they interact with each other, they share information, and some places even have <clears throat> access to information with the click of a button. The primary purpose of whatever we do in healthcare is to produce high value care. And that's another concept that came forward back in the 2000s. Uh, that matter of fact, this is the first concept that came forward. And that was, we need to improve the quality of what we do compared to the amount of money we're spending for it. And in that numerator, the quality numerator would fit concepts of measuring the outcomes of the services we provide, looking at the safety on how we take care of patients, looking at the service uh, and looking at the cost, not the line item cost, 
but the spending for that patient over time, because we may be able to do something extremely well the first time at a good cost, but if we're not managing the patient well, we may be doing the same thing again a second time or a third time or a fourth time, where we're looking at really the full management of patients over, over a period of time. Um, other groups that uh, we've worked with, for instance, the military, they have something else that goes in the numerator, and that would be readiness. Are the people functioning? Are they ready to, uh, to be on active duty? Uh, and many businesses have added that concept in also to something that they measure, which is basically productivity and able to work, presenteeism, all those sorts of concepts. Okay, the next concept that when we studied the learning organizations, uh, we did study learning organizations, we found that they have a couple of things in common. Um, they tend to have, that those were organizations that were also getting higher value care, better outcomes and at lower costs. And we found that if they practice in a way that they were integrated and providing coordinated care, at de facto, their end result was a better value. Integration means the way they work together and collaborated together to get it right for the patient. And coordination, slightly different concept, is basically how they use their integrative thinking and coordinating the care for the patient for the longer term. So those are two more concepts that were felt to be a fundamental to providing really good care. Another concept is individualized medicine. And there, we're, we're in the middle of having two components now in individualized medicine as a concept. One has to do with genetics and proteomics and uh, specifically designed uh, treatments that are targeted for a particular patient. That's one concept. But the bigger concept is designing the care so it actually improves the care for that individual. You may have a standard way to take care of a group of patients, let's say with asthma, but 80% of those patients probably will do well with your education and your standard treatments. But there's always a group that are tougher, harder, they're sicker, they need some additional help. And they're, they're, are, they're ones that really require some focused care, focused attention, and maybe individualized attention with reminders, uh, uh, follow-up visits, et cetera. So that's the other concept that uh, survived the discussions that we led through a large group of patients, of people and patients. The final one is the concept of studying the way we actually deliver care. Look for the best ways of providing health care at the delivery aspect and improving that care over time. Uh, people, some people would say, well, that's sort of lean, lean management. Yeah, could be. Uh, system engineering. Yes, indeed. You have to involve system engineering think thinking, but it's basically the study of who's doing it the best and what can we learn from them. That's basically it. How do we continue to improve the care? So those are concepts that to improve the care in a learning organization concept with getting higher value care, these were the main components that we felt at a macro level organization should be thinking about and having those tools to, perf to perform. Two other concepts came out that were not really the responsibility of the delivery system, but fell outside of it. And that is if we're really gonna have high value care, we need to find ways to pay for it. Because for high value care, if you do it well, actually utilization rates will drop. Patients will be better off. There'll be fewer hospitalizations, fewer visits to the ER, which means in a fee-for-service world, you'll go broke. If you do a good job, because we only get paid in fee-for-service, we get paid when patients are sick. And therefore, this idea of changing the way the payment is occurring was a concept that was promoted back in the 2000s. And we are seeing different models now come forward that really focus on trying new models of payment to support the new models of care. And then the final one uh, is uh, the concept of getting everyone insured. I won't go into detail that on that one uh, today, but uh, clearly this is the, in my view, the easiest one to accomplish. And our politicians have not been able to accomplish it. All the people who work for the federal government have insurance, federal employees healthcare plan, for instance. And for the rest of us, well, we won't go into too much detail, but we have so many people who are uninsured presently, 
were about 20 million, the current numbers. And as the emergency waiver was put in place for Medicaid patients, uh, that probably will lapse in around April. And all Medicaid patients will have to re-qualify, which they haven't had to do the last three years. And the current numbers suggest that another 18 million people will actually lose their that insurance, will not no longer be eligible. So worst case, we might actually see our um, uninsured numbers for this year uh, spike up. Of course, they will get additional insurance down the road, but they will count as many people uninsured. We'll be right back to potentially somewhere close to the 40 million uninsured where we were before uh, uh, Obamacare and the ACA was passed. Next set of concepts, just to, to look at those six principles that I listed, where might they fit into a systematic view of healthcare? And I won't go over this slide in detail, but the concepts are we have knowledge domain where individuals are doing research, producing good ideas, and occasionally with these little lines, they actually connect with each other and communicate with each other. But there's no, there's no uh, 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 intent to make sure that the knowledge domain completely knows what's going on in the knowledge domain. We're not all connected here uh, to understand it. We have the uh, care domain where we have all the different types of providers, primary uh, care providers, individual practitioners, group practices, specialty group practices, integrated delivery systems, and uh, academic centers, et cetera. That's where the patient resides. And that's where we have, that's what the patient has to deal with. And in that galaxy here, I mean, in that universe of providers, we have some galaxies that are pretty well functioning um, knowledge uh, systems, uh, and they have a way to coordinate the care a little bit better and they perform a little better. Uh, we also have the payer domain, which is total chaos. We have small insurance companies, large insurance companies, private companies, for-profit companies, the federal government has eight different insurance models to use, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, Federal Employees Health Care Plan, the VA, military system, it's the Indian Health Service. So there's all types. These, nothing is standardized in here. The, the billing, the coding is all different. And we get some feedback from the payer domain all the time. But boy, we just can't give any feedback out of the payer domain. Feedback mechanism over here for knowledge domain does work better. The results of managing these domains at the interfaces is an important thing to look at. The function of this interface, lots of good things come out, gets to some interface. We won't go into details, but you know there's, there's reviews that take place, uh, clinical trials, et cetera. It functions in such a way that in about 17 years, I think I advanced the slide, 17 years, the good stuff gets into practice. It's been approved, but the total identity of the appropriate use of that medication or treatment is not really accomplished by the time it hits the care domain. In the care domain, we have to do a lot more work to figure out the most appropriate way to use these new medications. And the result is it takes about 17 years to translate something into the care domain and have it be used appropriately about half of the time. So there's a lot of work that can be done to improve that interaction. Over here, we have all kinds of bills we can submit out to the payer domain. In some cases, we're paid more than we need. Some cases, we're paid less, Medicare, Medicaid. And then in some cases, things are not considered payable. I've always used these three items and the pandemic proved the proof of these three items, that these are care models that you can't get paid for. You had during the pandemic, but you couldn't before. What are they? Telemedicine, hospital care at home, and nurse provided care, particularly in the home. Uh, in, in the past and in the future, when this emergency waiver disappears, we'll probably find ourselves not being able to get paid for those things again, where we were before. The other concepts I listed, creating a value, and doing coordinated care is squarely the responsibility of the care domain. The idea of individualized medicine crosses this interface. 
and the science of individual of healthcare delivery crosses all the way across because part of science of healthcare delivery is how you get paid. How do we manage that? And then pay for value sits about here in this diagram and insurance for all is out here as a responsibility. So you get a feeling that, that we really do have a system of healthcare here. It's not functioning well, we can definitely improve it. It's not likely we're gonna be able to design it all from scratch. So we're gonna to have to deal with these cards if we're going to be able to improve the care for our patients. Another concept that has been going on is, is uh, assessing how um, a, a delivery system can look into itself and say, are we ready for the new payment models? And this idea of if fee-for-service is where we are functioning, the readiness, uh, the risk readiness, are we ready? Do we have enough integration to practice this way? And the outcomes readiness, are we ready for our outcomes to stand on its own so that we can demonstrate we are high value providers? When you're running in this area with fee-for-service, you don't really need to worry much about integration and your readiness, and you don't really need to very much about worry about the, the outcomes if you're going to be facing uh, that kind of a payment system. We've lived with fee-for-service, with price controls, and RVUs for, gosh, uh, RVUs came in about 1990, so over uh, 10, 20, 30 years. We have run the experiment on fee-for-service. And we got where we are today with fee-for-service. So new models of care are likely to be considered in new models of payment. So if we look at a new models of payment, looking at this idea of using a coordinated physician around the care of a patient, we can see we need a higher level of, of ability to look at our data, look at it ourselves, not be told by the, by the payer your data, but understand your data yourself. And you can operate in this category uh, no matter where you are on this scale of having a degree of integration and care. The next level is the shared savings. And shared savings is a, as groups have learned, is a risky model because you may do real well the first year or two because it's low hanging fruit. You can get savings by just concentrating more on your delivery system, redesigning it, and you get some shared savings, half of which, and sometimes more than half of which the government retains, and you get to share some of the savings. If you don't hit the savings targets, you may actually be penalized. So this has been a model that's been tried by various ACOs. It's not a coincidence we have had so many different models of ACOs because eventually there is no more shared savings that can occur, and if the and if the government keeps applying penalties, you just re ruin the whole system. You've got to a point where your savings are quite good, quality is good, but you're not able to make further savings, you get penalized. And that's what happened to the Pioneer ACO and other ACOs. The uh, Pioneer 32 groups signed up for it. Um, after three years, they were down to nine groups because some of these were pretty good delivery systems and they found that they couldn't keep hitting the targets that were set each year. 4% was the first year target for savings, 6% was the second year target, and 11% more was the third target. And this is when most groups dropped out. The, the Medicare just actually ruined the ability to continue doing this experiment. Bundle payments is a, is a separate model. It, it's uh, the model we use for transplantation. Uh, we contract on a bundle. You have a period of time you have to take care of the patient and the money is on the table at the beginning and you have to do everything you can to get really good outcomes. So you have to be able to redesign your system, measure it and look at it. And this idea of bundle payments uh, is one that is more and more groups are trying it, particularly in their specialty areas. There's even examples of bundled payments for patients with cancers. Uh, so that, that is uh, a, a, a model that is being experimented with at the present time. We have then another model of what, uh, what we call mini capitation. And that may be a capitation, fixed amount of dollars for let's say a full year for an identified group of patients. In Taos, New Mexico, where we've done some work, 
they take mini capitation for patients that have been identified by the insurance companies that are frequent flyers. They're sick, complex problems, multiple visits to the ER. So they've asked uh, Talos, or Talos has asked them to get paid in a way that they can practice any way they want to keep these people healthier and out of the emergency room. And, and it's uh, last I checked, it was about a concentrated group, about 600 patients. And they were being paid on a mini capitation to practice any way they want to get the job done. And then finally, the, the last big item is uh, the uh, full capitation. And you better be ready if you're going to do it. You got to know what your outcomes are and have a, a robust uh, uh, a data system. And you have to be highly integrated to be able to provide that care. So I just want to shift a little bit because when these new models come out, one of the things you have to start thinking about is how do I control the health of the patient? Because you want to keep them healthier. Now, health does not mean absence of disease. It means a disease and you're keeping people well with it. It's a disease you can't cure. And how do we keep them well? Now, do we think that healthcare and, and health are the same? What do people think? But go ahead and take a vote. Show us the vote, John, when you're ready. Okay. Yeah, good, good, I agree. There, there is overlap uh, between the two, but they're not exactly the same. The skill sets and uh, the focus is, uh, is different, but there is overlap. Determinants of health, many of you heard uh, the different types of concepts to consider when you're looking at the health of a patient or a population of people. And we have things like uh, the behaviors of the individual seems to take up the biggest portion. This is a report that came out in 2002 by Michael McGinnis from the National Academy. And the concepts, the numbers may change a little bit from year to year, and they're a little different in London and England than they are in the United States, but it's still the same impression. So their own personal behaviors are significant. That's become number one. The others, we think there's an element of genetics uh, that take place that, that impact the health of the population. Uh, in England, they think that percentage is a lot lower. Uh, here in the US, the numbers that we're looking at is around 30%. But then we look, there are social circumstances, there are environmental exposures to deal with, and then healthcare delivery itself does improve the health of the population, particularly when the population are people over age 65. If they've lived to age 65 and survived that long, once they're in uh, being cared for after age 65, really this number, healthcare, impacting the health and functionality of a person probably plays a much, a much bigger role, at least up to 20%. So the current state of health in the United States, how would you rank that? We have the five categories again. Do you think we have any improvement that's necessary? Hey, John, if you got it, got it there. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is, I think most people would feel the same way also. Um, okay, but change the metrics. I think we've just seen that happen with regard to obesity in childhood. I'm not sure about that, but it felt to me as I've heard it in the news, and I've only read one article on it, but it, it felt to me that we decided to maybe change metrics Maybe that's for the purpose of bringing more attention to it so more interactions can take place, which would be a, a good step, I would think. Okay, now, from the standpoint of designing something with regard to health, if you're caring for patients, and as individuals or as in groups, let's say groups of asthmatic patients or patients who have uh, individual patients have cancer, et cetera, uh, having a construct in your mind that eliminates the idea, the idea of genetics. Remove that out of the thinking because 
modifiable factors of health would include things like looking at the physical environment, looking at social and economic factors, and seeing if anything can be done to improve these. Physical environment, like for asthma, yeah, you may be able to do something to improve the environment. Of course, clinical care, here's where we put about a 20% impact on the health of the population. And then interceding with improving behaviors becomes another critical tactic that if delivery systems are getting into this business, you need to compare uh, and consider all of these aspects as, as you go forward and design care for patients. The top five main, leading causes of death for adults in the United States are all behavior related. I shouldn't say that, but they're related to behaviors that need modification. And this is the big top five here that we have in the, in the United States to consider. Now, natural life expectancy uh, the rankings with and without uh, fatal injuries. This is our national ranking for the United States looking at life expectancy. And I just used some data that we, we really can rely on. That data is pretty accurate. I'm, uh, the most recent data is not clear, so I couldn't use anything in the last 10 years, but if anything, it's worse than where it was and about what you're going to see. With, with fatal injuries included, in the life expectancy rankings, the United States comes out about 19. And the, the last I saw, which I can't confirm uh, with actual data numbers has put the United States down into the mid twenties. I don't know that that's true, but I'm just taking the, the best look that we've got for the United States so far with fatal injuries. Now, if you look at the United States life expectancy, excluding fatal injuries, we move up to number one. So there's a significant impact here for everything that would be call, uh, called injuries. Now in that category, they included suicide, gun violence, et cetera. And that's why I said, I think right now, uh, we would be even worse in this category over the last 20 years than we were uh, before 2000. So the question comes, should accidents, homicide, et cetera, count in measuring the country's health care delivery system. See, that's a separate, it's a subtle change. It certainly should be used to look at our health system, how we're managing health. But should we turn instantly with a knee jerk and say, well, this is the healthcare system's problem? Now, if we look at should the healthcare system be solely responsible? And this data now is a little more uh, recent. This is about 2017. This is the murder rate among some of the leading Western countries. Look at the drop off here. Car fatalities were number one in that category. And if you've ever driven in France, you can see the similar thing. I'm, I'm surprised Italy didn't make the list. Um, then drug use, we again are high. Our rate is seven basically per 100,000. Are these fixable by the delivery system alone? Or is this a bigger problem that the whole country has to face is a question that I think physicians should be pushing on at the same time. Yeah, we have a role to play here for sure and help. We may have actually caused some of this. Car fatalities, we can advise people, et cetera, uh, advise delivery systems on how to improve things like that. Okay, so then the that raises a question then, if it's not the delivery system, who's responsible? So let's see what you all think about that. Who is responsible for health in the United States? Hey, John, it'll be interesting to see what they show. Interesting, very interesting. So we think that the National Institute of Health doesn't have very much responsibility for our health statistics. 
whereas the delivery systems have a significant uh, impact in HHS, uh, which of course is supposed to oversee these other ones. So FDA doesn't, you're ranking none there. So, so in other words, it seems appropriate that if we're looking at health statistics, we can say that it's the delivery system's responsibility, which is exactly what I've lived through for the last 20 years. And yet we have an institute that's supposed to focus on health. Frankly, the National Institutes of Health function as the National Institute for uh, handing out research grants for basic research that frequently can be turned into patents. I have not found very much that the National Institutes have done to actually improve health. The delivery system had to fight to get rid of smoking, for instance, and we're looking at it in every single category, guns. We're expecting that psych psychiatric therapy, if, if, if the delivery system can identify people who need psychotherapy, then we'll have fewer suicides and guns. Uh, we certainly have a responsibility for the use of drugs that we prescribe, but I don't know how the delivery system is going to be able to control other ones in that regard. So CDC, et cetera, there have been um, recommendations that have not met with much support and probably never will, but the National Institutes of Health um, have 27 uh, institutes that operate. The, there's been suggestions that it written up in the science and in uh, nature and elsewhere, Blumberg, uh, uh, Blumberg um, Journal also, that the National Institutes of Health be redesigned to have three components. One is basic research, structural research, like it's doing now. Two, it has a sector that concentrates on the science of healthcare delivery to learn what works and what doesn't work. And the third is to focus on health-related tactics, like improving uh, heat islands, like improving education, like improving jobs and job security and the health of people who are in jobs and also um, women who have, uh, uh, you know, who have children. We don't do a very good job on that one. So just, just give that some thought of where you would see um, the responsibilities lying. It's, it isn't in any one particular group, but groups that should be doing more have not been in, this is my opinion and opinion of many other people who have looked at this. Okay, health and healthcare are not the same. A healthy population requires both to have uh, really uh, good healthcare and be focusing on their own health or have some others, the built environment, help them be able to be healthy. It requires really an orchestra. And the orchestra includes the public themselves, I believe policymakers and governments have to be involved. Public health needs to be engaged more in public health. I would say that the CDC uh, does not practice medicine. It had difficulty during the Ebola campaign uh, that we had uh, in, the, in the world. And they were very unuseful when the first Ebola cases actually arrived in the United States. It was left to the delivery systems to sort of fend for themselves. And the learning organization that should have been called for Ebola, we should have just dialed the phone number of the, of the uh, Doctors Without Borders. That's the group that had the most experience with Ebola, whereas CDC had very little experience and it was actually giving, early on, it was giving wrong advice on how to use the protective equipment uh, about the uh, doffing and undoffing their, their equipment. So. High value healthcare is another component that needs to be in the orchestra for providing health for the population. Healthcare does have a role to play, that's for sure. So if you look at this as the orchestra, uh, depending where you sit, there are many times that groups in the orchestra don't play any music, they're, but they're part of the organization that is trying to optimize the output optimize the music or optimize the care of patients. Whereas when in our country, 
all of these groups that are here in the orchestra are lobbying for their own self-interest. Just imagine an orchestra that they, or the people came together. They may all be excellent soloists, but when they come together, they make a decision to play as loud as they can and maximize their own sector and just play the whole time and maybe even play different music at the same time. We wouldn't get a very good orchestra performance out of that. So when you look at it, you look at something like this and that orchestra that's making the music for the public, there needs to be somebody, some person who is conducting. What I mean by conducting is setting the vision, setting the expectations and monitoring the output, not telling you how to practice but monitoring and looking at it and performing and coming to grips with, here's what we'd like to accomplish. That's our shared vision. Here's where we are. That's our shared reality. And we need to keep closing that gap wherever we look at it. And that's public health. You've got government, policy, health professionals, and the actual delivery systems themselves, for instance. That's just an example to think about what we can do. The other concept to keep in mind is that there is a prevention spectrum that comes into play here that requires a much closer relationship between public health and healthcare delivery. We fell apart in Maricopa County over this, in, in the state really, not in Mar Maricopa County actually had better relationships with the public health department in Maricopa County and also the folks in uh, Pima County had a much better functioning public health and delivery system relationship. But as far as the state goes, it really was not functioning very well. And we just need to learn that there's a role for public health to play. Clearly, at primary prevention levels, vaccines, stuff that goes in the water to keep people safe, uh, the uh, other activities, stop smoking, wear seatbelts, etc. When it comes to secondary prevention, they can also be engaged. Secondary prevention is fundamentally uh, uh, looking at people who have a risk factor and you're trying to uh, uh, keep uh, avoid them from getting sick or getting the disease that the risk factor could incur and getting involved in perhaps screening, like colon screening, things like that. So looking for people who are at a risk to develop a condition and doing what you can to prevent the condition. Tertiary prevention is for people like me. I've got five significant medical problems. I'm still functioning pretty well. And I'm happy that the groups that are trying to take care of me are doing it in such a way that I can avoid ending up being in the hospital. I can avoid being in the emergency room. But I still have conditions that are not going to be cured. How do they keep me well and functioning on an ongoing basis? Public health could play some role in that, depending on the condition. But as you can see, as we're moving to the right, the role of the delivery system is increasing. And when we get to quaternary care, quaternary prevention, that basically is doing everything that we do to patients in the hospital or in the outpatient, doing it correctly the first time, every time, with no side effects, no complication, no errors. That's really quaternary prevention. And those of us in the delivery system really focus a lot on this. I think everybody's focusing on this. Some groups are focusing on this, particularly groups that are living in a capitation environment like Kaiser Intermountain Clinic, Scott White Clinic, that's now part of Baylor uh, Group Partners. There's many of them. There's about We've come up with about 137 delivery systems that have their own insurance plan. And I do believe that you all have some responsibilities for capitated patients in your practice. And I, I heard the numbers were fairly high, but I don't know that personally for sure. <clears throat> so it's very likely you're concentrating on tertiary prevention also, and probably some degrees of secondary prevention in your practice, probably even a bit of primary. So what I'm trying to show in this diagram is that we've got a spectrum. The two concepts need to be linked but they can be linked if there's if you think of the construct of who has primary responsibilities here there's overlap here a lot of overlap here and significantly this is where the delivery systems have almost full responsibility to uh, consider 
So I would finish here, leaving you with just a last question, which is not a quiz, but it's just the last question for you to, uh, to think about. And that is, what would you do to, to design something that would improve the health of your population? And what would you do to improve the healthcare delivery for the patients who are sick? So we certainly in our concept of delivering care for patients have a, a few um, goals in mind. One is to prevent an illness if possible. Two, if somebody does get sick, can we cure it? Three, if we can't cure it, can we keep people well and functioning? That would be the tertiary stuff I was talking about. And if we get to the point that, that the patient's health is deteriorating, what do we do or what can we do to not walk away from the patient, but to keep them as comfortable as possible uh, over time? So I'll end right there, uh, John, and be happy to take any questions or any comments that anybody would have. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. That was a, a fascinating presentation. Uh, and I think for most of us who are primarily providers, uh, you certainly touched on a lot of things that, uh, you know, come into our realm of experience, but things that we don't think about that much because we're more focused on the individual mechanics of how to get the best result for the individual yeah. patient. Yeah, John, I, I, I'm, I've i lived through that. I know exactly what you're saying because I, I, I'm a pulmonary doc and we had so many different things we had to concentrate on when we, when we develop programs within our organization. But it's helpful to get more and more people, I think, to step back a minute, look at the bigger picture, and these constructs can help people think about it. They're, they're, not, they're not perfect, but it gives you an idea of, of each, each level that we're talking about, well, no matter what it is, how to do more value care, how to do primary prevention, how to do tertiary prevention, whatever it is, uh, and also how do we develop new payment models. Whatever that is requires thinking system thinking, redesigning, and changing. And you have to do that with some sort of a construct in mind. How do we make that work? Because for instance, if you take full capitation and you're living in a fee-for-service environment, it is really difficult to move over here. And most of the hospital administrators that are hospital thinking and hospital-based, when they see the dial moving if, if in a capitated environment, the dial that they're looking at is the use of the hospital, admissions, ER visits, et cetera. They will see those numbers drop. They will see a drop in surgeries if we do, do that capitation well. And when you get to about 15% of your practice now is capitated and you see those numbers drop, it makes people who think hospital centric very nervous. And they can't, they're in two canoes and one's getting out of balance and they get real nervous. And we've held several meetings about this one to just, when the question is, when is it that you can get to a percent of capitation and feel comfortable with it? Because you will be real nervous in the about 15, 20%. And uh, George Halverson, who was running Kaiser at the time, he said about 25%, maybe 25 to 30%. And we had somebody from Intermountain Clinic who, Intermountain Clinic has their own Medicare Advantage plan, Medicaid Advantage plan, their own commercial plans. Uh, so they are heavily capitated, but they got comfortable with it. But they're about still 60% capitated, not fully capitated. They're about 60%. They said they got comfortable with it. And uh, the, the person who answered that question said, is it 23.7%? Is so somehow they <laughs> Exactly. And we just got to laugh because that fellow is a mathematician and he, he it's, it's just crazy. But I think once you get to about 25 or 35% in your practice, that you can find ways to manage in a fee-for-service world and in a capitated world, and maybe different doctors are operating in those two sections. That's what we've seen in some examples. Uh, but it's really nervous as you switch to that other environment. We do have uh, several questions coming in through the Q&A. You can probably pull it up on your screen too and I can read them to you, but we've got at least six questions right now. Um, the first one uh, is, how do you solve the problem of healthcare navigation uh, 
Mm -hmm. No patient fully understands how healthcare is supposed to work, especially for the Medicare level, the jargon used, the complexity of scheduling, pathology of disease, and constant change in healthcare protocols. How are older patients supposed to understand and navigate this efficiently? A doctor doesn't even know its system well enough to help all the patients. Okay, good. Uh, first, I would say amen to that. He is exactly right. Both my wife and I are in that system, and we get our care. It's supposedly a very highly integrated group practice that has outstanding records, et cetera, et cetera, um, who currently is doing a relatively really bad job at this. Uh, and it's partly because many of the things that have happened to the doctors that have been the tools that have been given to them don't work right. Uh, the information systems have create barriers for th things that occur. It is, in my view, it is actually a lot worse now, this navigation and helping doctors and patients than it was in the past. Now, maybe it's just because I'm older and I'm living in the past and thinking about the past. But I can tell you, when you're dealing with a doctor who can say, I will schedule your test, I will order the test, and then says to the patient, well, you'll have to call and figure out how to schedule it. And nobody's guiding them through it. Nobody's calling up the patient to, to do it before. I came from an environment previously, before these recent 10 or 15 years with, that we switched over to IT systems, that the scheduling was all done at one time. Test was ordered and scheduled all at one time. Patient knew exactly what was next and just try to get a follow-up appointment that you have to do on your own. It's really difficult to navigate it. And I'm hearing this from all types of delivery systems, just not my own. I'm living in it myself in my own. And it's really tough. You got a portal, you get into the portal, you see your pathology reports, you see your laboratory tests and nobody calls you. Nobody follows up. Nobody, you, you have to ask for the appointment to go back in. So how do we solve this problem? We have to solve the problem by standing up for what is the right thing that should be done and getting our leaders to give us the tools because the tools are the leader's responsibility, not yours. And it's the responsibility of the leaders to provide the tools for the frontline workers that they can get their job done. Because I tell you, my, my doctors and my friends, they feel hopeless. They say, well, I, you know, I can't schedule this return. You got to do a certain thing, et cetera because of the barriers that we put up uh, ourselves. So I, I look at it that it has to be a vision that you want to accomplish. That's number one. You want, to, you want to solve all these problems that are in the list. That becomes the vision. Then you have to put the pressure on and design a way that this can be done, whether it's someone else doing it. But in my past, we just did everything through our secretary. We actually had secretaries. They could, they could actually schedule the appointments. They would contact the patient. The patient would be informed. And whenever the secretary called me and said, hey, you got to see this patient, bam, it was done because they says, scheduled it. Now, I don't know who schedules what. It sounds like it's in, in certain kinds of IT systems. And the appointments are way out longer than they ever were. Uh, we used to be able to get next day testing, next day this, that, and the other thing, and bring the patient back in the third day to see them. So I agree with Tony who asked that question that this, I think physicians need to stand up and say, what we're currently doing is just not right. We need to be able to improve it. And I can tell you in my history, it was a lot better in the past. There's no reason why we can't design something that'll be better. Okay. You can see this is a hot button for me. Yeah, yeah. The third and fourth questions were almost the same, so I think it'd be good to touch on that since uh, the people asking the same thing. I said, what do you think is the best, best healthcare delivery model? And the next person said, what do you think is the best healthcare delivery model? ACO, yeah. HMO, academic medicine, large uh, care systems like Kaiser, HCA, Essential, and Common Spirit? Okay, uh, very clearly, my I, I feel the best model for now uh, at, at this time, we we have evolved away from fee for service because this this century we're going to be able to do so much for patients, and they're going to be more individualized. I think the best model is to try to get the providers try to get control of the first dollar as much as they can, which would require folks to go at risk, taking capitation, if you will, 
And those groups that do it well, not everyone can do it well. We, we work with over 50 organizations so far since I retired at, and now work at ASU. And about half of them decided that they would try to um, launch their own insurance company so that they can try this capitation model. And the capitation model then gives you the chance to do whatever you need to do, practice whatever way you need to. Nurses still get their salary. They take care of patients in the home, use hospital care at home, use telemedicine. The, those systems are already using all that equipment under a capitated model, and they can design new healthcare uh, delivery models for the individual patients as needed without getting approvals and pre-approvals and all the rest of that. So I'm kind of a fan of moving towards the capitated environment. Some groups have been there for a while, like Kaiser. Intermountain Clinic has moved that direction for several years. And as I said, they have three or four insurance products that they use. Uh, we're seeing this happening at Memorial Hermann down in Texas, Baylor and uh, Scott White. Of course, Scott White has been in that environment for maybe 40 or 50 years. You look at their results and their results are very good. Follow-ups are good. Appointments are easy to get because in a capitated environment, you have to make sure the patient is as healthy as you can keep them so that you can make money. It's a total difference. Fee-for-service, if they're sick, great. You're going to get paid. And if they wait for tests and things, who cares? You'll get to it eventually and you're going to make the money. In a capitated environment, you don't want that patient ending up in the ER or in the hospital. You want to have 24-hour service. My, my daughter came off of the airplane from uh, Hawaii. She had uh, COVID uh, and she's in Kaiser. She called me and said, what should I do? It was about 11 o'clock at night. And I said, just call Kaiser and see what they can do to, to advise you. And she, they saw her that night at 1130. She went to the Kaiser facility and uh, they actually saw her checked her out. She was doing well. She recovered in a few days. She was fully vaccinated. Uh, so they basically reassured her and didn't even think she needed any medicine. And she was, she's 50. So um, they did, they, they did good well and they're doing really well for her, for her other conditions of which she has a number of. Um, so I really think that kind of a model uh, works well. The idea of HCA, Ascension and Common Spirit and uh, even the Mayo Clinic and Banner they're, they congregate doctors and hospitals, and they should be in an excellent position to be able to manage this capitation that I'm talking about. They don't like to. They, they've grown up in the fee-for-service world. They like it. They're used to it. They're geared up for it. But if they did were to switch to capitation, and some have tried it, uh, they would be able to manage it very well. Why do I say that? because then they can manage the hospital that generates their money, predominantly the money. They can manage the hospital not as a profit center, but as a cost center. Managing something as a cost center means you can shrink it, change it, develop new models, use the space. You, you know, If you close beds, it's like a catastrophe for uh, delivery systems that are hospital centric. But other groups, Mayo Clinic lives in this environment I'm talking about. We run our hospitals as a cost center. We have no hospital administrators. We use them to support our practice. And if we want to close beds, we close them. And if we want to put a transplant center or a vascular center in that space, we use it. We use it as we need it to support the practice, the outpatient practice. So uh, the degrees of freedom that having full control can bring to a delivery system run by physicians. That's another, physicians have to play a very big role in this. So I think a, the best delivery system is an integrated group practice, really physician led and being willing to manage for the patient's benefit and the payment model that right now would give you the most capability to do that would be one that you are taking capitation or you have your own insurance company. Okay, very good. And I'm going to summarize. There's two other questions here and a comment. Fantastic lecture. Please come and speak again in the future. So I'm going to summarize these last two questions and see if you can do it in two minutes because uh, we're out of time. Okay. Uh, one person asked, where should the money come from to pay for public health? And the other person says, 
you know, you mentioned the symphony example, who should write the symphony? The problem with orchestra model is that only one person writes the music, everyone else plays it as written. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. And and it, it's not a problem with it because it's a genius that wrote the music and it's the conductor that has to conduct it and give advice to the orchestra on how they sound. They put they create the color and the flavor. They create the pace of how things happen. So when you are looking at an orchestra and you want the orchestra to play well, find the best music that's going on in this country. Look at the best providers. Don't reproduce all their processes, but take their music and create it for your own purposes. You may have different processes. You may play at different times. You may have different things. So there's a way that you can learn from the very best. And that's how an orchestra, because your organization is its own orchestra. You make your music the way you want to, but there's really good uh, infrastructure that's already created that you can use and then change the music if you want to make it work for you and looking at your outcomes, change them accordingly if you need to. The other question is, uh, where's the money come from? Uh, the money should go like this. The delivery systems that, that we spent $4 trillion on tertiary and quaternary prevention, particularly quaternary prevention. Delivery systems create higher value care. We will save money. The estimate is around a trillion dollars is the moderate estimate, about 25%. Uh, of, of it is saved, it is waste in our current delivery system. My proposal has been at Washington, let's concentrate on that and money that's saved, don't take it out of the system, use it in the system to fund secondary and primary prevention. The, there, nobody's gonna vote for more money. We have an obligation, this is where the delivery system has an obligation to get involved and try to work really hard to save money that could then be reinvested in health related matters. Otherwise, you're just doing the same thing we've done all along by saying, oh, I have a new health program. We need more money. We got $4 trillion sitting out there and mo a lot of it is waste. So what can we do to make a commitment to improve health and healthcare uh, delivery? And the two are linked together. And remember there's 4 trillion bucks, 20% of the gross domestic product that you have to play with. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cortez. Uh, I think we're uh, out of time now, so we'll say goodbye to everybody. We'll see you next week. Uh, it'll be in-person Grand Rounds in the Cohen Center with a uh, special guest from Vanderbilt University, uh, 